Hi, I'm Lasteris. <laughs> I work a lot on consensus, and there I moved to working into a secret consensus, and then at some point we started not liking this assumption that you need a trusted party to generate your coin in order to terminate consensus. And then I started working a lot on randomness, and specifically randomness when the network is bad, when your adversary tries to actually not let you finish or tries to actually get your secret key. And I'm going to present basically a series of uh, papers that we have done in the last four years, more or less. I work at Mission Labs, and I'm also a professor at IST Austria. So uh, this is not the main innovation, but I would want to give you a bit of an idea of how we started. Like we didn't really start with the idea of randomness. What we really cared about was scalable consensus algorithms. So if you look into the work that is done in the last few years, you always get to see this assumption that you have a 2F plus 1 secret shared key that the consensus uses in order to reduce its communication complexity. Whether this is hot stuff that gets you to order of N efficiency, Jolteon is a new thing that is deployed in a couple of systems, or even in full asynchrony, the set of the art is VABA, which gets you to n-squared efficiency, which is actually the lower bound. The problem is that if your setup is bad, things are really bad. Like, you get broken safety. You get that the adversary can actually impersonate the whole consensus, the whole blockchain, to a client that doesn't know, and give completely uh, bogus answers and double spend and anything that they like. So what we did in our series of works is instead fix the setup and get it down to n cubed, which we think it might be the lower bound, but we haven't really proved it. And then, because it's decentralized, you can't really have a bad setup. You actually get security end to end, from the beginning, where you know the validators, to all the way to the end. And maybe if I manage to make it, I will show you how we can even refresh our setup very efficiently in n square steps. Right? So, I guess you've already, most of you know, if you do randomness, how secret sharing work, but let's talk in very, very high level. The idea of secret sharing is that you have some secret, let's say a public key, for example, and you want to give shares so parts of the secret to multiple parties. How do you do it? Well, you choose a threshold, let's call it T. You get a polynomial of degree T, and then you make sure that that polynomial uh, at the point zero has the secret, right? Then you just evaluate this polynomial at different points, and you give it to your parties. As a result, Thanks to Lagrange, we know how to take those points, interpolate back the polynomial, we have enough, and recover the secret key. Okay? So the secret, these are the shares. The shares can be as many as you like. It doesn't have to be exactly the degree of the polynomial. You just need the degree of the polynomial to recover the secret. So we started with some secret sharing, which did, did that, but it assumed an honest dealer. As a result, if you have a dishonest dealer, you have no idea if the secret is completely leaked or if the secret doesn't even exist. Then we can get verifiable secret sharing, where we add cryptographic commitments to the secrets, and this allows us to check that the shares are correct and know exactly what to interpolate. And if we get into asynchrony, there is even asynchronous verifiable secret sharing, which there are multiple implementations now, but it used to be that you kind of share the secret shares. As a result, parts that did not get secret shares at the beginning of the protocol can still ask around to collect back the secret shares. Okay? And once you have this amazing thing, you can make your secret be a public key. And then you can do cool stuff like you do threshold signatures that are constant size. So you can have a whole group, 100 parties, and if they all agree, or a threshold of them agree, which you have defined at the beginning, you can give a constant size signature saying, well, those parties have signed a statement. And even cooler, if you use some kind of unique signature scheme like BLS or RSA, then because the signature is deterministic, you can use it as a randomness, like signature is unforgeable, as a result you cannot predict it before you see the signature. As a result, you can actually use it as a random number. Why is this cool? Well, let's see a very simple consensus protocol, like host. Like how this works is you have a leader party, the leader party asks the rest of the parties, hey, can you commit on this statement, this block? And the parties check, they say everything is consistent, transactions are valid, cool. So they sign back each one with their own signature. Now the party will collect this proof, which is basically a concatenation of signatures, so linear size, and broadcast it to convince everyone that this is now a block that we can append in our blockchain. The problem is that this is linear size, so if you broadcast to everyone, you're already at n squared. So not really that efficient, especially in partial synchrony. 
So what we do if we have a threshold signature scheme is very simple. You first secret share the, the key that is the group, and then the parties just sign back using their partial share, this xi. And if you have enough, in consensus is usually two thirds, you can interpolate them, get a constant size signature, which is the secret, x0, and send it to everyone, and now it is just one message. So even if you broadcast it to everyone, that's linear, and that's really the best you can get for consensus when you want n parties to replicate the message. You can't really go below that. Okay, problem as I said, safety is broken the moment your setup is broken. Because if the adversary knows the secret share, they can just say the committee decided to commit on a different block and just double spend whatever they feel like. Cool. Now, why do we also like it in asynchrony, right? In asynchrony, we also get compaction as before, so we can actually reduce by order of n the communication complexity. But also, this randomness helps us circumvent this famous FLP impossibility, which more or less says for anyone that hasn't shared that really if you have a synchrony, you cannot really terminate consensus. And how do you circumvent? You cannot terminate consensus if you have a deterministic protocol. So how do we circumvent it? Well, you can get a random coin. These threshold signatures are also random coins if you like to look at them like that. And this makes sure that the adversary has no idea who the proposer is until you kind of have to commit to a set of proposers. And as a result, you can get liveness. Now, why is this bad if your setup is uh, compromised? Safety is broken, as before. But also, liveness is broken. And the problem with liveness being broken is that in asynchrony, you can never really know that your liveness is broken. All you can say is, maybe I'm unlucky and my randomness was not as good as I expected, so I will keep trying. And I keep trying and I never can never say, oh, let's stop and check that everything goes well. If liveness is broken, you can't really say it until the end of time. So, quite bad as well. How do we circumvent this kind of protocols? We use this idea of distributed key generation. So instead of having one party sharing a secret, you have every party sharing a secret. P1 shares a secret, P2 shares another secret, P3, P4. When you get all those parties each sharing its own secret, you can add up the secret shares to a combined secret and say, okay, now we know that as long as one of the parties was honest, then enough randomness randomizes the full result, and as a result, our setup is not compromised. Cool. The problem is when you go in a synchrony, because in a synchrony, you have faults. So you can only say, I can only wait for n minus f parties, because if I try to wait for more in a synchrony, I have no idea if they're messaging me or not. And now you get this problematic thing that you have to decide for which n minus f parties am I going to wait. I can wait for some set, some other people can wait for another set. We get different n minus f parties. If we say we terminate now, well, we no longer have the same secret. As a result, we no longer can actually do anything that makes sense. So it seems that we need to reach consensus to agree on which set of n minus parties we're going to use in order to bootstrap our synchronous consensus, right? So it's kind of weird. One way to circumvent it is to say, I don't care about asynchrony. It's a very theoretical model. No one cares. I will just assume that the system is synchronous once in a while. Fair, fair assumption, we can talk offline whether it actually holds all the time. But if you have that, then you can do something like this amazing work from 2009, where you basically just take a consensus protocol. It used to be something like BBFT. Now you can take something like hot stuff and just use it in partial synchrony to terminate consensus. So works. And it is not that bad. But you need to assume weak synchrony, which, as I said, may be good, may be bad, but not really interesting when you do research. You want to do the hard thing. And also, it kind of only allows for thresholds of f plus 1. But to get the compaction of consensus, you need thresholds of 2f plus 1. Because this is the quorum, the 2 thirds, not the 1 third. Okay? So, this is a starting point, but we want to do better. And to do better, we really had to look into what trusted setup gives you and what actually consensus needs. So, if you look at trusted setup, it gives you a secret key that is privacy safe by 2F, by 2F parties. So if you even have 2F compromises, your key is not leaked. But in consensus, we already know that if you have F plus 1 compromises, you are completely screwed, you get forks. So it really doesn't make sense to try to protect there. On the other hand, we get a key that's live on n minus F parties, which also matches the consensus needs. As a result, 
we just look if we can actually weaken the setup, which no longer would be trusted, to match consensus. And this is basically what allows us to get to a functional ADKG. So the first word that we tried to do that was back in 2019, 2020. And the key insight was really, let's try to get these different thresholds. And we had to build multiple building blocks with these assumptions. The first building law was we, is what we call a high threshold asynchronous verifiable secret sharing. High threshold because it allows you to generate keys that have a threshold of 2f plus 1, but this is really threshold to sign keys. Like if you have a plus 1 nodes compromised at the setup phase, you're already lost. And this is basically why it actually works, because if you actually try to get higher thresholds, you're going to not be live. So our key is safe as long as f parts are malicious, our key is live if you get 2f plus 1 honest party. So exactly matching the quorum intersections rules of consensus. How it works? More or less like most secret sharing protocols. So what happens is first you have a secret. You do some rich secret sharing or very foul secret sharing in our case, and you get n secret shares. Now you say, okay, but this is not enough. We might have slow parts to recover it. So although you get a 2f plus 1 threshold on this, uh, first secret, so you need basically two out of uh, three out of four of the secret shares to recover the secret. You go and you reshare your secret. Now the key here is that unlike the initial secret that has a recovery threshold of two f plus one, the secret shares have a recovery threshold of f plus one. As a result, you just need f plus one parties to help some other slow party to get their secret share of the secret. So it's kind of jumping around a bit. So let's see an example. Here we have four parties, S1, S2, S3, S4. S3 is malicious, S4 is in a synchronous, so it has no idea what's happening. Okay, so we try to secret share the secret. S1 and S2 say, okay, yes, we've terminated. S3 also says I've terminated, but will not participate later. So what we have is this secret shares, S1, S2, S3, and this partial shares, the Ys, okay? Now S4 wakes up and says, oh, I need to recover my secret share. I ask S1, I get Y41. I ask S2, I get Y42. If the threshold was 2F plus 1, this would not be enough, right? It would not be live. But likely because we have reduced the, share score, the threshold of the, secret share, of the shares of the secret shares, this is enough. We can recover S4, and now we have actually 3 out of 4 of the shares to recover the secret. And this kind of allows us to increase the threshold to 2F plus 1 for even protocols like the initial one, the partial synchronous one. So just using this high threshold AVSS together with uh, the protocol from Kat and Kohlberg, we can get a setup of hot stuff or Jodderon that is actually n cubed log n. So cool, we moved on, but again, we really want to get into the hard problems here. So this is where it gets really interesting. I can't really go deep into the paper because then I will take an hour just for one paper. But the basic idea is that once we have this HGVSS, we start doing building blocks. The first building block we do over HGVSS is what we call a weak distributed key generation. So this is weak because it might never terminate in asynchrony. So you always kind of think like it terminates and then you might be surprised and say, oh, there is more. And then let, let's keep going. So this works very simply. Every party does an AVSS protocol, P1, P2, P3. And then you're going to say, okay, I've seen at least F plus one parties terminating their secret sharing phase. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm willing to run this weak DKG with P1 and P3, let's say. This is the ones I have terminated. But it can be that later I see P2 also terminating. So I can actually update my prediction that now P1, P2, and P3 can all termin can all have all terminated, so I can use the new key with three secrets inside. Every party kind of broadcasts that. And then if you see two F plus one parties that have a matching set, so P1, P2, P3 in our case, then you say, okay, I'm going to try and run consensus with this key that has the secrets of P1, P2, and P3. But I might update later my prediction. So although I'm trying to run consensus with the P1, P2, P3 key, I just get another one. So I say, okay, now I also want to try with P1, P2, P3, P4. Right, so this can keep increasing. And the only limitation you have is that you can only announce larger keys. So you cannot just have P1, P2, P3, then go back to P1, P3, then go forward and say P1, P4. Your size of 
of, se of secrets in your key has to be increasing. And this is kind of what allows us to eventually terminate. Why does this work? It works because if I'm honest and I have seen P1 terminating its asynchronous secret sharing, then by the definition of secret of this protocol, everyone will eventually terminate the same thing. So they will eventually propose the same set, and as a result, we're going to eventually converge. All these eventualities, although are to eternity, so that's why it is weak. It's not necessary it will terminate. So I'm going to jump forward the rest of this paper to look a bit into the rest. The second key thing is that we do this eventually perfect common coin that basically uses the weak DKG output in order to flip a coin. If everyone agrees, then we can terminate consensus. If we do not agree, then we can try again. And the cool thing is that the way it works, you can only try at most F plus one times. Okay, so let's move forward here. So in order for this to work, because we have disagreements, we need to use a binary agreement protocol that can actually handle disagreements. Hopefully there is a ton of research in distributed computing doing binary agreements, and the one we could use was the one from Mustafa Oui and authors, which actually has n-square communication complexity. So as a result, n-square communication complexity ran for n parties in order to agree that each party has terminated their secret sharing, it's n cubed, f times, because we get f times that we can disagree, goes you to n fourth. You can play a bit around with error correcting code to get down to n cubed log n, but that's all. So actually, if you do it in VABA, you only get to n fourth because of the weak DKG that can't go lower. So cool, but it's actually not really that efficient. So we try to actually get practical solutions. And once you have the knowledge that it can be solved, you have really the persistence to start actually trying to solve it. The first was really, can it be solved? So what works with this practical ADKG? Well, there are like two things that we had to change in the black box in order to reduce the communication complexity to cube. One is that this two-dimensional secret sharing that I described is quite inefficient because you need two dimensions and each dimension is order of n, you have to broadcast it, so really you can't really get much lower than n cubed log n with a lot of optimizations. So instead, we managed to reduce it to n squared per sharing, so n cubed total, by using a bit more fancy cryptography, so encrypt and then prove your secret shares, and then using zero-knowledge proofs to show that the degree of your polynomial is the one you want. Check the paper to see exactly how it's done. It's not novel, really novel cryptography. You can find it in other fancy crypto papers. The second thing that we had to get out was the fact that our weak DKG is kind of too weak. We could try to binary search this convergence of F uh, disagreements to get to log n. We tried a bit. I think it's possible we didn't persist much, but that's it. You can you have to get a lot of rounds of disagreements. So we completely changed our approach. And again, all the time we want to answer this question, how are we going to boost our consensus? So how does the practical ADKG work? Well, again, n parallel uh, secret sharings as always, but now instead of trying to figure out what is the common key that we're trying to agree, each party just says, I believe, 1 and 2, for example, like node 1 says, I believe 1 and 2 terminate correctly. Node 2 says, I believe 2 and 3 terminate correctly. Everyone chooses a set of F plus 1 parties that they believe they terminate correctly. And they broadcast to everyone else, committing that I want to believe that. Okay? Once we broadcast, every node gets a belief of what everyone else believes. So node 1 here knows that it believes that T1, like 1 and 2, is the correct set the correct key set, let's say. Node 2 has shared the belief of node 1, and it has its own. Node 3 also shared the belief of node 1, and it has its own. But you might get, you know, I like it can be that parts are malicious, so they didn't really broadcast correctly. So what happens is that every party has announced what they believe is a nice key to use. So what we do is we do not try to converge on a single key. Instead, we say, we're going to run binary agreements, so we're going to agree on whether node 1 has terminated using its belief of who else has terminated. So you're running a binary agreement on the secret sharing of node 1 using its proposed key set of 1 and 2. You're going to run a binary agreement of whether uh, node 2 has correctly secret shared their secret using their belief of parties 2 and 3 correctly terminated, and so goes. 
So if a party was honest and correctly did this step, you have a nice key, they have a correct belief, so you can terminate binary agreement. You have a consistent strong key. That's beautiful. Okay. The problem really comes when a node is either malicious or didn't really give a correct belief, or is just crashed, because then you don't have a secret key, you don't have a coin to use in the binary agreement. And this is where it becomes interesting. And to really solve it, you need to dig deep into FLP. So FLP, if you ask any grad student of distributed computing that hasn't really read the proof, will tell you that FLP says that consensus is impossible in asynchrony, or deterministic consensus is impossible in asynchrony. But what the proof actually says is that consensus is impossible in asynchrony if you start with what is called the bivalent state. So if you start with a question, like half of the parties believe zero, half of the parties believe one, so it can go both ways. If you actually start from everyone already pre-agreeing on zero or pre-agreeing on one, it will terminate there. You don't really have a question to answer. So how we solve it is basically by exploiting this. The fact that if a party, if a malicious party or a crash party did not propose a key set, no one will enter with the belief that they have a key set. Everyone will enter with zero. And as a result, you don't need a coin for this kind of things. You can use one of the newest uh, binary agreements, the one for Tyler Crane, which is what we call good case coin free. If it starts from everyone proposing zero, you don't need a coin. You terminate in two rounds, you output. And as a result, for the honest parties, we're going to flip coins and decide zero or one. For the malicious parties, we're going to decide zero because everyone will enter with zero, and we can terminate the KG. And this can get us down to n cubed. So we are actually practical, and we implemented it. And as you can see, especially for low threshold, for t plus one threshold, it's quite scalable. Like even for 120 parties, a DKG takes 10 seconds. No, yeah, no, 40 seconds and uses account 10 megabytes of bandwidth, right? So if you're running it every day, it's nothing, right? You actually use it. And if you see, we even have comparisons with DRAN, and we actually perform better than DRAN, although DRAN is not asynchronously performant. Of course, this is DRAN of 2021. I, I, we haven't benchmarked the latest uh, implementation. But it is practical, at least for T plus 1. The real extra cost comes when you get to higher thresholds because of all the crypto you're using. And as you see, for 2T plus 1, especially the time explodes. Like for 64 parties, you only need two and a half minutes. So in a paper that we're going to be presenting in Unix Security, we try to kind of attack this last problem of getting ADKG if you need higher thresholds, because for consensus, we really need those higher thresholds, right? Uh, Let's skip a bit this. So the basic, basic idea, and again, be, go and see the paper if you care about exactly how it works, is that instead of trying to do the initial secret sharing on the higher threshold, like we did with the HABSS or with the practical ADKG, what you do is you do multiple, you share multiple secrets at the same time, all with F plus one threshold. And then you can use all these randomness, you can harvest it uh, using a hyperinvertible matrix to actually create a coefficients of a higher degree polynomial. So basically, you can just secret share two polynomials of f plus one, agree on the secret sharings like before, using basically the same ideas of ADKG, and then put them inside a matrix multiplication to get out coefficients for a two f plus one polynomial. Then you do some broadcasts, like this is kind of how it works, but I'm not going to go deep into it. And you can get any threshold you want from t plus one to two t plus one by only paying the cost of sharing secrets and committing to secrets of t plus 1. And as a result, if you look here, like this is the numbers of practical ADKG, so if you look at the 2t cases, you see that the performance is like 8 to 9x. Like, of course, it's more costly than doing a single sharing, but it is basically proportional to the degree you want instead of paying a huge cost to do the commitment. Um, running a lot out of time. We can also very efficiently uh, refresh keys. So once you have start, once you have a key, you can actually refresh much more efficient. Why? You have a coin, so you can use this coin to terminate consensus. You can use this coin to do sampling. And as a result, you don't really need to do, again, all these binary agreements all the time. You can just run real consensus. And the cool thing is that 
Once you do sampling, you can really subsample very low because your two-thirds threshold goes back to half. Like you no longer have a, an agreement to, to really decide. You'll need to make sure that at least one honest party refreshes. Uh, that's the APSS, even more efficient than the ADKG, so really, really practical. We can actually set up keys without making any synchronous assumptions now. And let me just talk a bit about this last thing, which is really how we work at Mission Labs. It's our new blockchain called SUI. And the basic idea is that you don't need to do all payments with consensus. You can have what we call consensusless payments using reliable broadcast. So you have a transaction, you can send to the validators, they can process it. You collect your uh, proof that they processed it. You send it back to the validators, they execute based on the fact that they have all a quorum processed it, and you terminate. So, super simple. And the cool thing is that you can use this workflow to run things like lotteries and do a lot of randomness stuff without, again, needing consensus. And it works very simply, again, if you have set up a secret share, it works basically on the same pipeline. You have a user transaction that also sends a seed with the randomness. The parties process the transaction and sign the seed with their partial share. Then you collect the certificate. You also interpolate the secret shares. This is the randomness. You send the randomness for execution and you terminate. The only important thing is that the, you are like you, the client, is the one that decides if they finish the protocol. As a result, you need to put the money in advance and claim them back at the execution step. Because if you want to pay later, you can just decide not to do it. But I think that's it, and I'm happy to discuss more on any of those topics offline or during the questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I actually have a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, when you mentioned trusted setup, do you just mean like a common reference string model, or is I it I mean a trusted dealer. A trusted? A dealer, like a node that has okay. a secret and does the secret sharing and then sends the shares to everyone. Yeah. And um, then you said you would test it with DRAND, and we've had feedback from, you know, like I don't even remember who told us, but basically they told us when they tried running a DKG with DRAND with like, I think it was 256 nodes, which we've never done so far, um, they encountered some bug in DRAND itself. Uh, did you run such big DKGs and did no, you see such bugs? No, we tried or? to do 128 and it didn't terminate, so that's why it's up to 64. But it didn't terminate because of the time it took. Yeah, or like after, the after three min after three minutes, you're like, okay, let's kill it. I don't want to pay AWS anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it could be that it's very very slow, but you know, it's already very far higher than what we cared about. Yeah. And uh, uh, the final question, I guess, uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, we really wanted to move to an asynchronous uh, DKG setup, and we are reworking the way we do mm -hmm. DKG and everything. So. Currently, what we do is Pedersen DKG and uh, resharing, following yeah one of the mm -hmm. Pedersen-based papers. I think yeah, I don't even know where the resharing comes from. Anyway, it's very basic, you know. And so, do you have a recommendation, maybe, of what we should be implementing in practice if we were to change our DKG, knowing that we want to do a resharing with the new scheme of the o of the same secret we already have from the Pedersen <laughs> DKG? Yes, yeah, so like DKZ have two components, like you know how you do commitments, how you do the initial sharing, and how you agree on it. So you can more or less keep the same, like your commitment scheme, like you can do it with Pedersen if you want, and just look into the black box of how to agree on it. Like, so it's really completely modular, so you can move what you have by changing the message pattern and get it asynchronously. You usually don't really need to change the crypto. You might pay a bit more in like, communication complexity, but I guess you wouldn't care much. Like, if you want to keep the crypto, you keep the crypto. There's nothing that interfaces the two in such a way that you have to really co-design them. So what you're saying is we should just stick with what we have? Uh, you can stick with what yeah. you have if you want to keep it on the crypto side and really look into the message patterns and how to create a protocol that is asynchronously safe and, ter and live, basically. And so, do you have a, like a specific one in mind, or like a, there is a good practical one? Um, I, I would say that you can check our papers for the most practical ones. And which which I, one? There's a practical ADKG. I guess you're th 
your threshold you want is f plus one, right? You don't care about high thresholds. Yeah, we might want. Like, when, uh, yeah, when you say threshold, you mean the threshold of malicious nodes, right? Yes. Yeah. So we might want to have more than that, maybe. The, thi the thing is that in asynchrony for liveness, but, uh, in asynchrony of the setup phase, that's all you can get. Okay. Right. Then, then, like, let, let's take it offline. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Ooh, another question at the back here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank uh, you. Do you have uh, fundamentally different uh, requirements uh, for consensus for uh, producing new, I don't know how you call it, new pulses of randomness mm -hmm. versus uh, resharing state, states where you want to reshare the key? Where I would guess you actually want almost all the parties, not just the majority, to actually get a new state of their key share. So not really, because what you can do is make sure that a majority gets the shares and they can help the parts that didn't show up get them whenever they show up. As a result, if you have a high threshold enough, they can recover later. What if uh, the first majority, just because the second majority was late, what if the first majority includes malicious parties that will no longer... Th that's why you want 2F plus 1 to say, okay, I have a secret key, right? So F can just drop dead and the other F plus 1 can help the slow ones recover. So you need to play with the thresholds. Any final questions? Oh. Yeah, so uh, I, I think in your uh, protocol, it's uh, multiple rounds. And yes. that's kind of make it challenging. So if you are going for sort of non-interactive version using uh, publicly verifiable encryption kind of mm -hmm. uh, approach, so does it make the asynchronous problem kind of straightforward? It's still challenge. It's not the rounds, really. The problem is that you need to harvest somehow randomness from inconsistent proposals. So it won't really make it easier. Like there are different trade-offs, I think. Like, and also in the complex, there are different trade-offs because if you want to publicly verifiable share the secrets, this is an order of n by definition message. Like you need all the secrets and everyone to verify them. So th there are right. really good protocols with that, and they also have similar complexities. Right, right. Okay. For the full non-interactive, like it's not really asynchronous. Like to be full, full interactive, you would need to use a blockchain. So you're already cheating there. Right? You're putting everything on a broadcast channel. Like if you're assuming broadcast channel, you mean right? Yeah. If you have broadcast channel, then That's this is irrelevant. Right? The whole point relevant. here was you don't right. have a preset up broadcast but, channel. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Okay, we can talk about it. Yeah. That's fine. Of course. Oh, we can take more questions. We're uh, ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing I want to understand better, it seems like this is like really well designed for, the threshold is really well designed for the blockchain use case. Basically, like, uh, I guess what you end up with, it seems like, is that uh, if you actually had F plus one malicious parties, they could then basically use the share, their F plus one shares to reconstruct all the shares for all the other, the two F plus one shares for the, the second layer, and then have the actual secret. Is that right? Yeah, basically, if the mm -hmm. parts were malicious at the setup phase already, mm -hmm. then they can just start the transcript from the beginning and figure out what happened. If they get compromised later on and you had the higher threshold, then they have deleted this byproducts and you can actually survive your actual threshold, even oh. if it's 2T plus 1. So it depends when you compromise them. Mm. When, can you, wait, when, when, when are they able to delete the, by, the byproducts? Is, do they, they, don't they need those to by, bootstrap uh, uh, offline parties or asynchronous parties? Or is that not true? De depends on the, s like for the first protocol that I've said, yes. But then yeah. if you do like things like encrypt and then share, you then encrypt it for the public key of that party, right? Uh, so that you can't really do anything there. You can't just open it up. You can only give it to them. Got it, that's interesting, okay. No. Okay. Go on, we'll take one more. Uh, sorry, uh, just maybe like very basic and I just want to make sure what you're solving. Um, so you're just doing uh, VSS or you're doing, uh, you call it distributed key generation, but it's not like, I, don't, I didn't hear the word like DSA or El Gamal. So it's just uh, shared randomness, just uh, VSS. So wh what are you doing again? 
No, no, we're sharing a public key, a private key, we're secret sharing a private key. You can use Elgamal encryption on that key if you on feel top. like it, like any kind of. So the primitive, uh, I mean, you call it key, so it's just shared randomness, you want like, to do Shamir secret sharing of a secret? That's your it's basic task, or sorry, I just want to make sure I get the basic problem you're doing. Yes, so you want to s to generate a private key, Jointly. so shared randomness if you want to call it. Yeah. So we just one time, right? Well, well, like, like, yes, well. but you keep it secret so you can then use it again and again. And right. then you can use like the last thing that I didn't really present, the resharing, to refresh that. You can either refresh it, so... For proactive... Uh, so, so, yeah, so for active, so you can share zero, so the key seems the same, or you can actually run it with a new right. key, right? You can just run it with a new key, and now everything is new. You just lose the interface. Right, right. but then the I, I'm just curious, because it looks like N, like the numbers N I, I've seen, like, was like 60, 100. That's like negligible number. So I, I'm trying <laughs> to understand why... Sorry, it's like I'm not a distributed guy, yeah, but yeah. Uh, you're, like, fighting for this N to the fourth N cube, but my understanding is the problem with 60 parties is just waiting for round trips. Whether it's n cube and to the tens, it's irrelevant. It's like kilobytes. It's like totally irrelevant, right? So I'm just trying to understand why you're fighting for this. Is it like a theory question or this is a bottleneck? Like it, 10 it, kilobytes, megabytes is like irrelevant. It's also on right? the computation of these ends play a role. So there no, you also 128 cube course. is like what? It's like, uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm just trying to understand because n is like 100 for computers who run like billions of instructions a second. So why why is this important? Just high levels that I understand this. I, I, so like, I, I don't really... Or why do, don't think terminate? Like why, why are you saying like in three minutes? So I would imagine for n equals 100, even if you take n to the 10 protocol, it will terminate under one second. So something didn't terminate in three, se three minutes. W what is the problem in this field? Is it just this round trip? So computers adversarially online, to me, like n cubes is super fast for n equals 100. <laughs> it's like not even a question to optimize. So I think that the point is that you want to get it to, like you would want to refresh this key basically every hour, let's say, right? So if it, and also it's in a synchrony, right? So these numbers work because all messages are delivered on time. If you start having shaky network, the more messages you have to send, the less will arrive. The more you have to resend it, it can very easily fan out. But I, in general, like, I get your point. But I could be wrong. It's like oh, everybody is doing it, so I'm sorry for asking basic questions. So I think that or? this is, like, this is twofold one. It is still quite, quite slow. Like, you can't really generate keys in seconds or mill. Like, yes, we do that now because we can, but if you could do millisecond of generating fresh randomness, you could do a lot of other blockchain applications that now you basically no one will even implement. Mm -hmm. So one, you want to go to the possible and see what people will do. Right? And I forgot what the second was. <laughs> anyway, like, I think that, and, ah, yeah, and the second is that we use this complex theory as kind of a guideline, you know, like, let's get more efficient. No, it's a beautiful theory question, sorry, it's just I'm trying to put practical head, which I'm failing. <laughs> so, so in practice, the reason it's, like, important, it's, is it really this n cube and so on, or is this is, like, round trip, n cube is, like, a red herring, you know, n cube versus n to the four, so why do you have these practical problems? You know, when you do your experiments. So I, you I can tell you, like, because ADKs is not really right. a thing that is very practical. I can tell you in consensus where we have the same thing, right? So PBFT was the the holy grail for many, many years. And the problem with it was that it had an N cubed view change, which is a lot of messages. Like, if you have a buffer, you can't really have 8 million messages there or 8 right. billion messages waiting to process. You're going to start dropping them. Right? And as a result, the protocol will never terminate because you have to assume that messages will keep arriving, the network is shaky. Right. right? So there are practical implications on this kind of stuff also because they're on asynchrony. Okay. Thank you. Let's take it offline, but thank you. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thank you very much, Lefteris. Thank you. Um, another, put your hands together once more for Lefteris.